All right. Well, first of all, thank thank you everyone for joining. Welcome to this session. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the use cases for UAV toolbox and how UAV toolbox is kind of integrated to PH4 and how it lets you deploy controllers, um, estimators to an autopilot as long as it's running. Uh, you know, it has the PH4 architecture pushed onto it. So before I just jump into this, uh, I kind of want to just have an idea of, you know, what what your reference is. Um, so if you've used MATLAB and Simlink in the past, could you maybe put a plus sign in the chat just to get an idea of how many of you here have potentially used? Give me an idea of how to showcase things and how much to talk about specific things. We got two or three. Oh, great. I, I couldn't see any. OK. So a small group of people, which I assume then UAV Toolbox is also fairly brand new to most of you. Right. So in general, UAV Toolbox started out as a, a great way to build out and simulate um, autonomous algorithms. Uh, it was released in 2020 as a support package, which is like um, an additional add-on with a specific tool. Um, because of the no amount of use we got from it, we actually built it out a little more, and we've now pushed it out as a product itself. Along with the autonomy algorithms, one thing we wanted to work on was integration with autopilots. And so I'll go over all of the little pieces. Um, I kind of want to keep this interactive, so if you guys have questions, uh, just feel free to interrupt me, come off, say, hey, I have a question. So I'm going to first talk about just an overview of what MATLAB and Simulink can do. It's, it's very common to build out your system architecture in MATLAB and Simulink. Here you can see the first thing I'm showcasing is platform modeling. I'll talk a little bit about this, but it's the idea of representing your platform, the dynamics of your platform. Um, you know, could be just by a point mass in space that has some force and moment associated with it. It could be a full-scale detailed platform, but I'll show you some examples as we go through. The second one is algorithm design. So if, as you can see on the side, we have some simulations here. Um, or we have a scenario that we're visualizing. We, this, this is actually Unreal. We can deploy sensors into there and read sensor data. So this could be just the position of your platform, uh, an image frame that you're seeing, be it a standard camera or a wide angle camera. And you get to modify the parameters of your camera. We have LIDARs, radars. Um, a couple other sensors that we provide right out of the box to work with Unreal. So this supports algorithm design, right? Um, we also provide, um, if you're using LiDAR, we have a, a set of tools that let you collect individual LiDAR frames and then register them. Um, we can now then start building out a pose graph to do some SLAM. Um, I'll talk about planning and decision making. I have a, I have a specific demo that I'm going to showcase for planning and decision making, and of course, controls. Uh, you know, our, our bread and butter is controls, and that's kind of where we started out, but we have about 120 different tools right now. Another piece that's very important in our general use case with our customers, usually AeroDef is doing uh, certification. That includes verification validation and DO178 or other DO certifications. Um, that's mainly focusing on the air industry. We do do a lot of work with Auto 2, and so that comes, uh, I see um, functional safety and other certifications that come with that. Right, so, so far I've only talked about simulating with sensor models, um, but we also support actually deploying uh, most of what you've written in Simlink or in MATLAB itself. We can generate C or C++ code. We can push this just as source code or dynamic libraries. And then you can call them within your application as you'd like. One example of this I'll showcase today, which is actually deploying to a cube. Um, I don't know how many of you, oh, I have blur in my background, so I don't know how many of you use cube oranges or cubes in general. Uh, anyone worked with the cube before? Uh, a cube pilot? Yeah, we use uh, them all the time. Nice. Which, which one do you use? Usually the orange cube. The, nice. Uh, this is the plus. Just the the cube, We've, you know. This, I've used the blue cube too as well a, a bit on the red cube, but mostly okay. these just orange cube. So we support. We've 
the um, MATLAB and Simlink actually pushes out releases twice a year. We have an A and a B release. Um, in our 24A release, which is this year, it comes out on March 20th, uh, we're going to start supporting the Cube Orange Plus. Um, of course, I, I've already worked on the Cube Orange Plus as we were building out the support for it, and so I'm going to showcase that today. But we do already support the Cube Orange and the Cube Blue. Uh, the Cube Blue, we didn't actually work towards building. One of our customers told us that your support for Cube Orange works perfectly with the Cube Blue. So before that, we supported the Cube Black, and then we have a, a slew of Pixel based uh, autopilots that we support. But as long as it's built off of uh, the Pixel standard and can use the PX4 stack, we can deploy to it. Um, so if you have more questions on that, I'll be happy to talk about that a little more. There was a specific video that I wanted to showcase, uh, but it's confidential. And because you guys are recording this, I actually can't showcase that. Uh, it's this platform itself flying in space with a cockpit view and a battery monitor, uh, battery health monitoring system. So I won't be able to showcase that, unfortunately. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about broadly what all do we support. So, so far I showed Unreal, but we also have lower fidelity uh, scenarios. Like if you all, all you want is a cuboid, you want some LiDAR, you want some IMUs and GPSs and you're building an ETF, you don't necessarily need a photorealistic environment. But if you do, we support Gazebo, we support Unreal. Gazebo through ROS and a backend uh, C++ API that we wrote. Unreal is directly through a C++ API we wrote. Um, so, because we can support Gazebo through ROS, any other ROS-based simulators like Isaac Sim, uh, True, Unity, uh, we've we've built demos with that. So you can have your platform in there. You can use the physics in there if you'd like, or you can use the physics here. When we deploy, we generally have our platform physics taken care of by us through the uh, actor itself, and then Contact and Dynamics can you can leave that to the simulator. Right, so multiple different hardwares that we can actually deploy to. Uh, specifically, if it's um, ARM-based, uh, ARM Cortex-based, we can easily deploy to those. Uh, we can just generate the source code and let you integrate it. But here I'm going to talk about two, which is PX4 and NVIDIA platforms. We support a lot of NVIDIA platforms. And the benefit of these two, it's a very tight integration. So in the PX4 I'll showcase today, you actually get access to the PX4 bus. So I can read from, say, the sensor bus, or I can read from the EKF, I can read from vehicle position control, or vehicle position, local position. So I give you blocks that actually read from uh, different message buses, anything from uh, the micro message bus. And in NVIDIA Jetsons on specific boards, I give you access to uh, GPIOs. So if you want to read from, say, the, say, a specific J4 header, the second pin, um, you can build that directly in Simlink and MATLAB, and you don't have to write any driver-level interface code. And then connect. So this is over MAVLink. That's what we support right now. So if you have a ground station that talks via MAVLink, if you have a, a platform that you can send MAVLink messages to, uh, be it your entire mission itself, you can do that directly from MATLAB and Simlink. We can become a MAVLink client um, and send out MAVLink uh, messages. So I talked a little bit already about just UAV toolbox, the different things we support. Any questions so far? Talked about platform modeling. I talked about design algorithms, so autonomy algorithms, simulation with external simulators. I think Terry, Terry, you have your hand raised? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering uh, if, it's, if it's just PX4 drones or if I had another drone inside a RS2 environment, like uh, like a DJI drone using yeah. a third-party wrapper, uh, could I use MATLAB and Simulink to control it that way? I understand that the autopilots would be different, and mm -hmm. like DJI's autopilots are a closed source, and yeah. uh, and that's, that's a difficulty, but I still think like physics are the same, and I should be able to fly around a little bit with it. Right. So if, if you have a way of interfacing with it, like a network protocol that you can send messages to the, you said an RS2 protocol? I'm not really sure. Uh, it's, it's a, so there's a, a library for DJI called PSDK that lets you put a computer uh -huh. on the drone. And yeah. through the computer, 
were able to uh, uh, get in to ROS2 as as oh, a node. ROS2, okay. As a ROS2 node. And, yeah. uh, and I'm able to, right now, from the command line, fly the DJI drone around in a ROS2 project. And I'm looking Great. for a way to simulate in either Gazebo or Unreal. Yeah. So uh, ROS, MATLAB does speak ROS, which means I can actually set up, if you're in ROS2, MATLAB can become an individual node, connect to the same domain that you have the rest of your ROS2 nodes running on. And now you have access to all the topics that's available on that domain. Yeah. So from MATLAB itself, I can create a message topic. I can publish on that. So just like you're doing in your terminal by yeah. doing a ROS pub, you're actually you can do the same thing in MATLAB in some way. So and that can, can be your terminal. And I can anal I can make a node where I use MATLAB to analyze like some lidar data, and uh, and other tools together in a node and all that stuff. That'd be that'd be a dream. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we actually have a couple. Uh, demos that we showcase just on ROS itself. Uh, that's that's how I work with Isaac Sim. So I I let Isaac Sim open up its ROS2 bridge, and then I talk to it using ROS messages. Great. Now I can either do this just as MATLAB and Simlink, you know, directly there, or whatever I've built out. Say I have a uh, a, a subscriber that reads from somewhere, and then I do some processing, and I have a publisher that pushes out, or maybe even actions and services that I'm using within this. I can then compile this directly into a ROS2 node. So I'll generate C, C++ code or C code in the back that I can provide to you as a source package that then you can go and compile or do a call on build in on your actual um, ROS stack. That's great to hear. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, so ROS1 and ROS2 is fully supported. ROS2, right now we support Humble. Um, so one thing that we do is with specific versions of MATLAB and Simlink, we have specific distributions that we support. That's the easiest way for us to manage and have our tests done well. Um, but yeah, if you want to learn more of that, I'd be happy to uh, be, talk to you about it. I, I have uh, Isaac on a on a Jetson Orin device right now. Okay. Hooked up to the uh, M350 drone, and that's all working great. I just got to uh, I got to learn about how to use Arviz and how to model the drone for the simulation. Sure, yeah. We have some tutorials that I can send you away, Terry. Terrific. I don't, wanna, I don't want to dominate conversations. Yeah, so I'm sure. Gonna, uh, I'm I know I have a couple yeah. other questions. So, um, Blake, do you right. want to go next? Blake, you're, you're mute, mute, Blake, just in case. Uh, may have lost him. Ajaya? Ajaya? Okay. Oh, Wait. okay. Keep going. Oh, oh no, Ajaya. Oh, there we go. Any comments, Ajaya? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you now. Okay, sorry. Um, something's going on with my microphone. Uh, actually, uh, I didn't have a question. Uh, the hands was, I think I raised it earlier, so. Oh, I, I get you, understood. All right, no keep worries. going on. If you have if you have one, feel free to ask. Sure. All right. So one thing that we've been doing recently is building out large reference examples. Um, if you've seen some of our documentation, it's kind of small scoped examples, but we've been starting to build more larger system examples. And I'll show you one of those. One being where we started our package delivery. So you're reading something from a GTF. Um, this could come in as a, a Mavlin mission and then we take that mission and deduce it into what we need to do. Uh, we have a platform model in there, we have sensor models in there, and we have a scenario simulation. So kind of build out the entire end-to-end -end workflow. We call it reference applications. We recently built one for vertical takeoff and landing. So we have our entire platform kind of built out. We have our controller, you know, a mix of multi-rotor and fixed wing with a scheduler for the tilt control, like as I'm transitioning, uh, either forward transition or backward transition, how quickly do I want to tell, tilt my rotors? It's fairly complete examples. You can go look at them uh, online. I have some references in these slides. Uh, that will give you links to actually move through them. And I'm happy to share these slides at the end of this if you want to look at them anymore. All right, so quickly going through platform modeling, I did mention that we can do this at different levels of fidelity. Um, the lowest level of fidelity 
would be a guidance model. So it has a platform and a controller both together. You can kind of build out what's the mass of your platform, the initial matrix of your platform, and then you provide control commands. And that will differ based on if you're a fixed wing or if you're like if you're providing a role, uh, pitch, uh, thrust, and yaw. You also have environment commands, which means we can provide gravity, which generally we're flying on Earth, so gravity stays steady. Um, but then you can also provide wind. Uh, we actually just came up with a new wind model for turbulent wind and uh, laminar flow wind. Uh, so you can decide, you know, if you want to put your door in some heavy wind, how would it respond? The second piece of fidelity is moving up a grid. So now I'm actually building this out using first principles, right? So I have a point mass that I'm going to provide forces and moments to. The forces and moments you have to actually build out, right? You know your platform, you know the distance between the CG of the platform and where your propellers are. See, if I'm spinning at a certain RPM, you know what kind of moment it's going to experience. So you kind of have to mathematically model that out. And it's very common for aerospace customers to do that, um, be it um, a, a, a single engined aircraft or a guidance missile. Um, that's very common for them to use. Whereas then you have kind of the the highest fidelity of modeling, you've built out a CAD model of all the parts, all the mates, all the joints, and you want to use that to represent your platform, we have a way of importing um, CAD assemblies. This could be from SolidWorks, Autodesk, PTO, Creo. Um, we can pull those in. And that represents your platform model. So different levels, you know, if you're if you're kind of looking at autonomous algorithms, you might not want a very high uh, high fidelity platform model, or if you're kind of building control laws, then you want a fairly high fidelity control model, uh, platform model. Lost control. Great, right, so I wanted to give you a couple examples. Sorry, I skipped over. I wanted to give you a couple examples of some things we do. You can see here how we're like, um, Utilizing LiDAR data to segment out where the ground is, where vegetation is, where buildings are. Uh, we can actually generate LiDAR point cloud data and register them. Um, we also have a way of colorizing our, our LiDAR object has a, a, a color member in there. So we can take an RGB frame, a LiDAR frame, do some calibration on them so we know where a point to pixel is. And then we can colorize those so you, don't, you get a fairly nice LiDAR point cloud that's colorized. Um, we do pose graphs and EKF estimations. There's a, a lot of detectors that we push right out of the box that you can use. These come with different tools. So of course, you have computer vision, navigation for pose estimation and EKFs or planning, uh, LiDAR toolbox for registration alignment, different registration. I think we have six different registration algorithms. What I noticed is registration works differently based on the features that you have in your LiDAR itself. So, um, one thing that we do is we keep the signature of the function very similar, so you can kind of use the same arguments, go through all the different algorithms to see which one works best. And you get a lot of control. You can decide on, you know, uh, what's your grid size that you're going to merge with. Do you want to downsample this before you go ahead and do uh, registration? Do you want to denoise this? Um, do you want to add some artifacts to it? And I'll show you that in a little bit too. So this is another example that we built out. Uh, this was for called Clarispace, but it's the idea that they have a QR code and they have a platform that needs to land. So they're looking at the distance of the QR code and estimating at what approach angle, at what approach speed they need to move through. Um, one example of utilizing a scenario simulation and a fairly low fidelity uh, platform model, all built out using UAV toolbox. A couple other things that you get with UAV specifically is um, these few blocks, so you can see a path manager. I'll talk about this a little later. Waypoint follower is fairly straightforward. You have a, you have your current pose, a couple of waypoints. If you're a fixed wing or multi rotor, there's different um, um, outputs that you need to provide to kind of follow those. And so we generate the set of control commands to do that. That's for following a waypoint. We do the same thing for an orbit. So if you have a center and a radius, we can give you the control commands to keep orbiting around a certain point. This actually comes with uh, navigation. So navigation provides an object to generate an occupancy map. 
3D occupancy maps. Now with that, we can go ahead and generate a plan. You can see that's a fixed wing plan. Uh, that's a randomly sampled plan, so it's gonna be not optimal. Then we can go through that plan and reduce it by just checking node through node to see if collisions exist and smoothening that out. So that initially generated plan, which is fairly tedious because it's randomly sampled, uh, we can reduce that and create a much more optimal plan. Yeah, so I did mention cuboid scenarios. I'm gonna run through this fairly quickly. This is, as I said, if you don't want photorealistic uh, visuals and you're really working with LIDARs, radars, um, IMUs, like localization, this is a great place to start. It's very easy to set up. We have a bunch of examples that show you how to walk through this. Um, and you you know you don't need a, a, a GPU or a really performant desktop to be able to run these. Additional things that you can do with scenarios, we can take DTED files and use them as your floor plan. So your terrain can be imported. You can see there we have a UAV with a circular LiDAR facing down and we're mapping the terrain. Or you can also import OSM building. So if you uh, want to say, look at the city of New York or Chicago, you can pull those in, fly around and uh, make sure your algorithm works the way you want to. Now, when we go to more photorealistic scenarios like Unreal, as you're seeing here, you can see that we can start adding effects like particle nature, like wind effects, rain effects, the time of, time of day, uh, and then test out. You also see if I zoom this in within the LiDAR, you're able to capture the little droplets. Um, so if it's a heavy rain day, you wanna test out how your denoising algorithm works, this is a perfect way to be able to do that. All right, last uh, kind of overview slide. Uh, some of the sensors that we provide directly for, uh, to use with Unreal, you can see there's an RGB camera, there's a depth camera. We use that depth camera to generate a point cloud out of it. Um, and if you've built Unreal scenes, you can actually have a label for each of your assets in Unreal. So you, with that, you can kind of build out segmentation without even having a, you know, a classifier network running. You can read segmented data and try to see, if I had this information, will my drone be able to follow the road? All right, this I will do quickly, but it's, it's a flight log analyzer. It's kind of one of the first apps we built. T logs, U logs, custom logs, you can import them, you can visualize them. Uh, we draw the actual path over a base map. So if you've, this is actually a flight over one of our paths, uh, one of our office buildings, but then you get to add specific signals too, right? So you wanna look at axle, gyro, attitude. You wanna modify this, maybe you wanna see axle versus V height. Um, you get to do a lot of it and then you can span through specific sections of this entire log to see why did the EKF throw, or why did the EKF dot not match? Um, something that our customers use a lot, um, it's it, the layout can be customized the first time and then you can share that layout with other people and it makes it really easy for them to analyze their logs. Okay, that's kind of where I'm gonna stop for a second and we're gonna switch over to building out a large workflow. So any questions on the higher, level functions that are provided. There was autonomy algorithms, sensor simulations, planning, uh, building out scenarios. Hi, uh, I was wondering why you said to have a low fidelity model for autonomous simulations when you're talking about the drone models? Right, that's a good question, really good question, Terry. So, what I've noticed in customers is say I'm gonna build out a drone to do something specific. I'm gonna follow a truck and drop a GPS sensor on it. Say two teams are going parallel and they're gonna start working at the same time. The platform, the platform team, um, for mechanical engineers, are probably not ready with the entire platform model. So I don't really want to wait for them to finish out their platform model before I start using a platform model to build out my autonomous algorithm. So at that time, I can start with a low fidelity model because I'm expecting that the controls team will build a good controller that will follow the platform dynamics of the platform team. Whereas for me, I'm just expecting that with this low fidelity, I can represent where my drone's gonna be in space, 
and what my sensor data is going to be. So I use the low fidelity to start building out my autonomous algorithm, which is here's an image frame and here's a detector that gives me a, a, an ROI around a truck. What's my, how, how should I follow this truck? Got right? it. And then I can, then when they're completed or at a, at a better step, I can start integrating that into my model. So this lets an autonomous engineer kind of get started. And so when you, when you start with a less fleshed out model, are your physics different in the simulation until you get the actually more fleshed out model? Does it make a difference or is it all just a simulation so it doesn't matter what it looks like? No, it does. It does absolutely matter because the, the state that my plant is going to be at the night next time step is totally be based on the on the, the, of the model. Okay. Right? Yes. So I, I could say that Say in an image frame, I have a couple pixels that I want to centerize. And in my low fidelity model, it, it would centerize much better and not have a lot of dynamics in it. But when I start building my second one, now I see because of the additional dynamics, I'm I have a lot of vibrations. Okay. So I need to remove those. I, I understand now. I, I understand the level of simulation going on. Thank you. Um yeah. I get it. Uh, and in my case, I actually have a drone model provided by DJI that I was planning. Uh-huh. They gave me an SDL to use, so uh, I'm excited to plug that in and see what happens. Nice. So we can import that SDL directly into MATLAB and Simulink to use as your platform model. You would have to build out some of the dynamics, like if you're looking at a certain prop, right? So the SDL model is going to give you the size of the prop itself, but you might have to say, if this is spinning at, our, uh, say, 1,300 RPM, how much lift am I getting mm -hmm. when you pull that in? Wow, oh, interesting. Okay, thank you. I'm yeah. taking notes. Yeah, of course. All right, so... Uh, also, go ahead. Or not. Go ahead. Uh, Multi-part kind of... Um, the first off, the DTED files, what levels do you support? All of them, or...? That's an interesting question. I don't think I've heard of levels of DTED. Could you clarify? Is that different format, uh, so or...? And it's not just uh, it's a density level of the DTED data. So uh, it's mm -hmm. been a while since I worked with it. If I recall, DTED level four has uh, spacing increments every meter, uh, okay. and then down to you know, working backwards, I think it's equivalent to twenty seven. It's it's a multiple of three, obviously, okay. but I think it was nine or twenty seven meters. Um, so that was one. Okay. So resolution and, uh, in a sense. It, it, yeah, it's just resolution files. I've had to create them when I work for Boeing, but yeah, they're ridiculously huge once obviously the resolution goes up. Yeah. The second is, and I, I haven't done a lot of Hill Sill using MATLAB Simulink uh, quite a while. Uh, using the DTED data, uh, I'm assuming you can plot all the outputs of a course if you take it in either you know degrees, minutes, seconds, lat long, uh, something similar so you can repeat the path. So, um... What I don't think we have a limitation for your first question. I don't think we have a limitation on the resolution of the detail. Um, we, okay. But as you start plotting more dense data, you're going to slow down. It's going to take more performance, right? We've imported oh, yeah. detail from Mindfields, and we actually do some post processing on the detail to like fill in layers that might not be there. So we can oh, do course, that yeah. on the back end. Right. Um, sorry, could you repeat your second question again? I lost a train of thought. The, the second question was just uh, with the toolboxes, the way they're done, uh, can you extract the path if you took something along DTED? Uh, yeah. Let long or degrees, minutes, seconds? Yeah. So let me actually pull up a, um, a, uh, another reference algorithm that we did, right? Uh, here. Yeah. I'll open this up. So this is an autonomous haul truck navigation in an open pit mine. So we start with the USGS point cloud. And we take that and skeletonize that and generate a, technically a graph that we can navigate on. So the planning problem becomes much simpler. So we start with this point cloud. And then we convert that into an occupancy map. Right, so take the point cloud. Look at all the flat surfaces, look at the slopes. And if you have any place that's flat, we can call that as navigatable path for a haul truck. Awesome. And 
use that data. But you know, we do some processing to this. Like we might have small gaps that are open that really is not navigatable. It's it's bad for the planner to sample that space. It just makes things slower. So we fill in small holes. Or we remove okay. anything that has a slope higher than 15 degrees because we're never going to navigate over that. But then we end up with something like this that we can use for 2D planning. And then from that, we kind of build out different types of planners to be able to navigate that space. So this is a low resolution, like a low le level, low fidelity simulation. But this one also comes with an Unreal simulation off the mine scene that we created with a dump truck that navigates through there at following just this one. So this has three different types of planners. You know, there's a global planner that gives you a reference path. And then you have a local planner that, um, you know, looks at any additional obstacles, looks at your actual constraints of your vehicle, and then moves it along this path. You can kind of see the red line being drawn by the local planner over that global map. So, okay, yeah, yeah so like a, we can, a minimum, okay. Mm -hmm. So we can actually do a lot with the data, detailed data that comes in. Okay, and then a slight tertiary, not, uh, you've mentioned a lot of capabilities. Does the UAV toolbox have the ability to import a model or is that where you have to do the different Simscape uh, toolboxes and tool sets? Yeah, so a DTED can be pulled into a UAV scenario, but if you want to take that DTED and generate a point cloud out of that, or if it's a point cloud that you're pulling in, that would require LiDAR toolbox. Oh no, yeah, yeah, I meant for the, the STLs because you had mentioned bringing in a model of something. Yeah. The, the UAV toolbox won't help you do that. You'll need Simscape of some sort, right? Yes, you'll need Simscape to import, Simscape multi-body particularly to bring in um, STLs. Multi -body. Yeah. Okay. All right, I know Perfect. we're getting close. Uh, we have 20 minutes and I do want to go over this demo. So I'm going to do a big picture now, right? And I know, Godfrey, you've seen this before itself. This is kind of the model that I want to talk about today. I know I'm showing a Pixel 4 here, but I'm going to talk about using it as a cube. So a couple of things here. I have a ground station, Q ground control, because I'm working with PX4. I have a flight controller. Um, in this case, it was just a quad multi-rotor flight controller. I have a plant model, fairly simple quad plant model. I have a scenario simulation, which I can do either using a cuboid that we talked about, a low fidelity or a high fidelity Unreal. And then I have obstacle avoidance algorithm that's running on my host itself. But what I do for this is I take this, take the generated sensor data, I stream that over to the uh, NVIDIA Jetson. I deploy this algorithm on the NVIDIA Jetson, and the NVIDIA Jetson provides OBC commands to my uh, uh, autopilot. So OBC commands have to run at much lower rate than you know lower level uh, control commands. So even if you have some delay there, we're able to make this work. In the actual autopilot itself, it's it needs it at 100 hertz. If you can't make that 100 hertz, it's going to complain. It's going to throw out some fail safes. You'll see that right now as I'm sharing my screen and trying to run this all on my laptop. It's going to complain a little bit. But the, the trick to what we showcase here is we take our plant model, which is, so the scenario simulation is always gonna run on your machine or like an ORN, as you mentioned. The plant model is what runs in Simlink and we push that onto a speed code. It's a real time target that can go ahead and maintain a certain rate. So if you need um, IMU GPS data, because this is hardware in the loop, we disable all the sensors on our autopilot. We can go ahead and generate that data at 10, 10 milliseconds as required. So I'm gonna stop the presentation here and just look, showcase the demo itself. Uh, I will share these slides with you. It kind of walks through step-by-step step how you would build this, like start with the flight control and the plant model, go through plant identification. We did this with actually a UFI drone. I, I'm sure you guys have heard of UFI. They do light shows, they come to PX4, they're a fairly high member. So we did a couple of flight tests, got the data, we used that flight test data to actually build out our plant model. Um, it's a tool that you get from Simlink called System Identification. It does a parameter sweep of, uh, this is my reference and this is my actual output, minimize the error for me. And so it's gonna give you CG, it's gonna look at uh, questionnaire torque, questionnaire thrust. So you, you don't wanna build 
you don't want to estimate everything because that's going to put you in a minima somewhere. Um, take the best educational guess that you have and then try to find parameters that you can't figure out, like wheelbase, wingspan. Fairly easy. Take a ruler. Question or torque, question or thrust, not that easy. So those you can let system composer, uh, system identification fill that out for you. All right, cool. So um, I'll go to this one in the, actually, let me showcase this. Actually, I'll, I'll come back to this. All right, so now I'm going to do PX4 hardware in the loop for a vertical takeoff and landing tilt rotor plan. This is the one that I mentioned. Uh, most of our examples are written just like this, so it's very detailed. It tells you everything that's going to happen here. It also walks you through a couple of the prerequisites, like you can see here's the architecture of the PX4 stack. How do you set uh, the autopilot to be in hardware in the loop mode? Um, what are some additional settings that you have to go through? Um, what we do is we take a specific release. So right now in 24A, we support uh, 1.14 or 1.14. Um, we just started supporting that. So you can clone that, build it. And then we, when you change something, we do a delta build. So we take out the position and attitude controllers in there and put in a symlink app, which is going to read from the estimators and provide a control command. Does that make sense? What we plug in and what we remove from PX4? Yep, got it. OK. If you look at this uh, link, it actually sh shows you that too. Um, but I'll share this with you, and you should be able to look at it. Uh, this is, it just popped up, so I'll show it to you. Oh, in the pre-release, I don't think the documentation is available, but just Google this and you'll be able to find it. It's there in the earlier versions. So the, this is the pre-release. The, the actual release will go live in about a week now. All right, a couple things we want you to make sure, select the right airframe, add these parameters so it doesn't like bog down when you're landing or going to land. How you should connect. So you can see that we have a USB connecting to UAV, the dynamics of the plant model. The flight controller actually gets deployed onto the target itself. And then over UDP, we talk to Q to ground control. Similarly, over UDP, we would talk to Unreal. I'm going to skip the Unreal piece for now. All right, so this actually goes through and shows you how to open a project. It's just a collection of files. It does path management for you. So if I were to share this with someone else, you know, all the files are referenced from a certain point. We have a controller and a plant model. We set up a mission. This is a mission with transition. So you can see first we take off as a quad. We then transition into fixed wing. We fly to that wave point. We orbit around the point, And then we land as a quad itself. So both forward and backward transitions. Um, we have a separate example that talks through how to build out a UAV uh, VTOL platform, how to tune hover, how to tune fixed wing, how to tune your forward and your backward transition. That's actually the reference example we released um, our last release. So if you're interested in vertical takeoff and landing uh, platforms, it's a good, a really good starting point. All right, so this just goes through the missions and walks you through each of the different pieces, like this is the controller, but I'm gonna go ahead and actually show you the controller itself. So some things you'll see, you can see that the hardware board that I've selected is a P cube orange. Uh, every time you build out a firmware for a specific board, it's going to come listed here. There's a bunch of boards that we support. Other than actual PX4 targets, you can also target a few other boards. Come on. Right, so if I pop this down, you can see this is everything under the PIXOC frame that we support. You can also put ROS, and that's going to generate a node, or you can do a ROS2 node. In the GET hardware support packages, there's a lot more other targets like PI boards, ARM processors, if you specifically want efficient code for that target. So here I'm using the cube orange. Uh, I think our next board that we're looking at is the CUAV. Uh, I can't promise that, though. OK, so look at the actual controller that we've built. We have inputs that comes from the estimator. Really easy to build out. I know there's a lot here, but because it's a VTOL, it's a little more um, specific. But I'm reading to see if my actuators are armed, my local position, my attitude, my odometry, all directly from the PX4 bus, right? 
So this I know is available in the message bus and I can read it. And we provide these blocks that you can double click on. You can select all the messages that we ship directly out of our box. This is all PX4 messages. And you can build custom messages. If you have a specific message that you want to use, you can build that and use it. Now, of course, we do some processing and then send that downstream, the estimated output. This first goes to our path manager. I've talked about this a little bit. So in this case, I am, I'm, I've, I've built out my mission already. I'm not connecting to QGC. I've just built out my mission. I will be pushing all the sensor data back to QGC so you can visualize it. But instead of this, you could just have a Mavlink read. So you can read the mission, wait for a mission to get completed, and then execute that mission. So I have estimator that's providing all my states. Uh, then I have a mission coming in, and then I have a, another piece that says ground. I'm just looking at the Z uh, altitude of my drone to see if I've landed on. Now, this is something we built out with our VTOL. So this is a guidance logic. Uh, you can skip most of this, but the idea is based on which state it is, if it's in cover, if it's in fixed wing, if it's doing transition, I have to provide different set points, right? Either in, yeah, as to a quad, I can provide an XYZ yaw set point. For a fixed wing, I'm gonna have to give uh, a look ahead point, maybe course, heading, uh, attitude, airspeed, control. So these all are changed based on what state I'm in. Now, if you've seen a Mavlink message or mission, it includes everything, right? Take off, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Now, what the path manager does is it reads those and then sends it to our guidance mode selector, which is say a finite state machine that says, I'm in this state, this is what I'm supposed to do. Oh, I'm done with that state, I'm going to the next state, that's what I'm supposed to do. I transition back to this state. That's what we do in our guidance mode. So you can see that you, this is a start. I don't know if you guys have used state flow, but this is what state flow is. It's really great to build out finite state machines that have parallel states or continual execution. And all of this can be built with either Simlink models underneath them or just MATLAB functions. Uh, so whatever you prefer to use, you can use. But here you can see that I have a start entry point. It's built all just using code, MATLAB functions. So I'm setting some initial values. And then I go into a, a junction where I look at what is my flight mode? Am I in back transition? Am I in hover? Am I in hover with mode one? So I've built out all these transitions to tell me where do I go from here? If I'm doing hover entry, I enter here, and then I go into first wave point. The only reason for hover entry like this is because that's the only time after back transition that I'm not gonna take off. Otherwise, if I'm in hover, I'm gonna take off, go to wave point, orbit, maybe forward transition, or go to land. Whereas if I'm in fixed wing, I'm gonna first stabilize, make sure that I have the right, I can't go to fixed wing <laughs> unless I have a certain airspeed. So if I want to transition to fixed wing, I'm going to have to get to a certain airspeed before I transition into fixed wing. You can see there's, there's a, uh, a fixed wing waypoint uh, state. There's a pre-transition before I go to back transition, because if I'm going to now go from my propellers forward to do this, I have to get into a stable state. I can't be doing it while I'm pitched all the way up. So this is finite station machine. This is kind of your logic diagram of how are you going to control the mission if you know how are you going to go through this if the mission changes in multiple different ways maybe a couple back transitions couple forward transitions and this is really easy to test try different missions and see where your transition is actually not great all right so this goes to the entire controller piece right i have mission waypoints coming in here i have a guidance test bench that provides set points that's my path manager now it comes to the actual controls. Now that I get these commands based on if it's a hover set point or a fixed wave set point, what do I do with that? And that's where we built out. And all this is already built. You should be able to use it. There's a multi-copter controller, a couple PID loops, inner and outer. There's a fixed wing controller that's a little more trickier. They can't just be uh, individual loops. They're all coupled. And then I have a scheduler here deciding Am I in tilt? Am I uh, coming out of tilt? And what command should I send to my motors? Right, so 
Set points coming in here, motor commands actually going out of here. And then finally, I have to send that to actuators. In this model, we're actually using actuator outputs, but you can use uh, PWM outputs if you want to send it to individual motors. You can use the new uh, actuator motors or actuator servers if you want it. Uh, this was built a little further, that's why, you, or a little earlier, that's why you're using actuator outputs. You can kind of see all the reference. So this entire set, this entire model, including the path manager, the finite state machine, the two controllers, and the scheduler, with my estimator read and my actuator out, is going to get deployed onto this. How do you do that? You just go and click on build deploy and start. I'm not going to do that. We have like eight minutes. I want to show you the rest of the piece. I've already deployed it to this. It's running. It's ready to run. Um, it's not taken off yet. It's not armed yet. What's the next side of this? So I have a controller that I've deployed onto my autopilot. The autopilot is communicating with my machine using USB. It's just reading serial data. So what we do in this is I do have to talk to Q ground control and I have to talk to the pixel. So I'm reading data from the Pixoc, and I'm going to send data back to the Pixoc. I'm also going to oh, call it a Pixoc. I should call it cube. I'm sending it to the cube. I also have to send data to Q ground control, which actually happens on this port. So this says source. This says sync. It's just reading in data from the Pixoc, from the cube. This becomes our central bridge that's going to send out. If I want to now send out data to Unreal, I'm going to do it over UDP. I can do it over C++ if I want to. And then it's going to do some uh, platform dynamics. So it knows my current state, where I'm trying to go to next, has motor commands. It's going to see what does my platform do. Because we're running hardware in the loop, you can see that I have HIL sensor, HIL GPS. The sensors are disabled, so we have to actually emulate those sensors. We give you sensor models. So in here, I have airspeed, GPS. Uh, this I know the best, because this is what I built as a part of this. Airspeed, Barrow, GPS, and IMU simulation. We right now have this using ground truth states, which means they're not estimated, right? So I'm taking these sensor values and I'm actually feeding it. Uh, but I can choose to not use the sensed or estimated values. I can just use the ground truth itself that I'm getting out of my PX4. So this is my plant. It also does my sensor simulation. It also acts as my bridge to be able to read data from the pixel, because that's the only thing connected to the cube, it's the only thing connected to the cube, and it's also going to send data over to cube ground control. All right, so the platform or the controller models already deployed. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to hit run on this simulation. In cube ground control, I've disabled the pixel link. It's only going to wait for a UDP message. So as long as it gets sampling data over UDP, and that's as soon as this starts running, this will connect, and it will say, hey, I have a platform here. There. So it's seen my cube. It knows my cube is here. It says it's not ready because it's saying vertical velocity is unstable and some errors. After I get a couple data samples of sensors, it's going to balance out and say it's it'll be ready. Once it's ready, I should be able to arm this. Come on, it's usually quick. It's not getting a height estimate. All right, so now I'm ready to fly. As I mentioned, I've preloaded some missions into this. I can go and arm and start the mission. So you'll see, now I'm taking off. Come on. There you go. It had a weight. Oof. It's losing. It's losing itself. Um, I haven't done this while I have both my screens. Let me actually stop this for a second. Uh, my laptop can only handle so much. I'm going to remove one of my screens. So I'm reducing the amount of CPU utilization right now. Go back in here. I'm going to unplug the cube and plug it back in because it was in a flying state and I want to bring it back. 
I'll disconnect this. So you'll see here itself why it's important that your plant model, which does a lot, right? It simulates the sensors. It's actually acting as a bridge to read data from this, from the autopilot and send data to other places. It's important that this is running at a high rate. And that's the way we actually, you know, the final piece of this demo is deploying this plant model, which does more than just be a plant, onto a real-time target. So it doesn't matter if I get a Teams pop-up or OneDrive starts updating, it's not going to slow down my plant. All right, it's running again. It's very clear to see at what rate I'm running. So I'm running a little slow now. I want to be running at wall clock time, but I'm running about half of wall clock time. All right, so it's ready to fly. Let me arm it. All right, you can clearly see it took off much quicker this time. It's still lost position there. But it's going to take off. I will show you the mission that it's trying to do. It's trying to do just a take off, go to, do, oh, it's struggling. I swear, I can stop sharing my screen, and this will work perfectly fine. Right now, it's struggling. It's losing position. It's still trying to recover. Um, this is unfortunate. I'm going to stop it because it doesn't actually seem to be recovering. It is actually running on the cube, but the cube is not happy with the rate that I'm sending back my sensor data. So let me actually just show you a video of that instead of sitting here showcasing this. Right here. This is a video that we recorded while actually also having our plant deployed to the speed code. Right, very similar mission, deploying the controller. This is a different controller, not the VTOL one. Deploying the controller onto the Pixhawk, you can kind of see all the build and how it pushes that. This is the plant model, and then some interfaces for Speedgoat. Speedgoat's great because you get access to a lot of UI. Maybe you want to provide, you know, you want to connect your motors and see how the motor winds up and use that data to say how much thrust you're getting rather than just saying motor RPM has gone from zero to 1300 in a split second, which is not necessarily true. So that's where the plant comes in because uh, the speed goat comes in because you get a bunch of UIs. You can actually pull in battery um, at a certain rate to see how your battery degrades while your motors are spinning. All in a bench test scenario. So here, I'm doing the same mission. I have Unreal on the side too. Uh, this is just a quad. We will actually push the VTOL demo over here too. You can see I'm taking off. As soon as I reach my takeoff height, I'm going to start maneuvering to the next wave point and the next wave point. Now, what's the benefit of simulating this? What I can do is I can say, all right, at this state of your mission, because I'm simulating the sensors too, I can say, what if you lost all GPS? which is exactly what we do next. Or what if I inject like a, I don't know, a step or a chirp into your attitude measure, any one of them, say roll pitch yaw. How are you going to respond? Will I be able to deal with that? What if I add north east wind that's really heavy? Will I be able to deal with that? This is all that you can do in simulation itself, right? You're testing out if your drone's able to maneuver these tricky conditions. So right now I disabled GPS. It says no global positions. You can see GPS satellite failed and I've lost track. It's just tracking away. Is that what I want to do? Do I want to maybe add a camera to say if I lose GPS, I should do some VIO and keep my drone based on the features that I can find? So these are things that you are enabled once you have a simulation environment. I also want to showcase one um, a couple of really cool things that we added recently. So I did say we can pull in terrain information. So here's a fixed wing and two helicopters. There's no limit to how many uh, assets you can control. So here's a, I built, I think this is in California. I forget exactly where we pulled this information from, but we used cesium underneath Unreal to build bringing geospatial data. And you can also use OSM along with our Google tiles to bring in building information. So this is Chicago and two helicopters flying through Chicago, all controlled by Matt Labinson. 
uh, this was a uh, kind of a, a a next step to the the one we just showed in the suburban scene. This is flying through Chicago. Um, you know, maybe you're do, building out the next uh, primary that's going to deliver our burgers to us. That's a great way to do it. All right, to finish off, I have two things I want to show you guys. I know we're a little over, um, but here's an example of how to build out different types of controllers. This is done right in my office. So this is a detuned acro controller, and this is a tuned stabilized controller. Each of them built and deployed directly from Simon. Um, finally, I want to kind of leave off with this. Um, we've been working with NASA really heavily. Um, they used our pipeline to build out their controllers on the cube itself. That's the cube, not the cube, plus, uh, cube orange, and not the plus. And just one takeaway that they said was this solution made it easy to take simulation developed control laws and implement it into a flight vehicle. In the past, hardware integration was notoriously difficult. Now we can deploy and test a new flight controller in minutes. We're still working with them heavily. Um, but that's where I'm going to leave you off. Uh, I can show off some test flight that NASA did, um, taking off in heavy wind to see if you can still maintain that attitude while facing that heavy wind. Uh, they did a couple roll doublets in the heavy wind to see if the controller is able to maintain altitude while doing roll doublets. And of course, they also tested out landing. Um, this is their initial research platform, and um, we're, we're going to help them move to different platforms. Uh, they use the PX4 stack, and they use uh, MATLAB and Simon heavily. Uh, they also write papers about it. There's a paper that they have referenced right here um, in case you want to read. But that's really all I had for you guys. Uh, I but, hope that it was informative. I hope you guys Ronald, that was great. That was really cool. Um, Okay, um, I'm going to be selfish again to start off with. Uh, I know people have questions, but my first, well, first of all, David Rausch wants to know, can we get the slides? So yes, you could send me the I slides will, up. I'll I will post share them. the slides with you. Thank you. Also, pricing, what's pricing like? Pricing is, so if you were to buy, uh, there's there's different models we do pricing with. Um, so you're a startup, which is for less than five years in, in the market, you have less than a uh, million dollars in revenue. In that case, you have either you can buy individual tools and you get 50% off, or we do a suite, which is for a MATLAB suite without the Simlink products. It's about $1,600 per person per year. That's over 80 tools. Or you can go to the Simlink version, which gives you about 120 tools, and that's 3,600 per person per year. And the startup model can apply, be applied for four years till you have to start work paying full prices. Uh, okay, and, in, and the, in, the, the uh, full price is twice that, the, I take it, then, yeah? The full price is a little more than twice that. So if you were to just take a year worth of MATLAB, just MATLAB and nothing else, for a full price would be $800. Now you add MATLAB, Simulink, which is 1200 and then UAV Toolbox, it's about 1300 So you'll pay close to three grand for MATLAB, Simlink, and UAV toolbox per year. Just three toolboxes. Oh, okay. Whereas the, the suites are- Oh yeah, the suites are a lot more. Insane. Oh, you get 120 tools. Uh, the actual value of the suite is probably close to eighty, ninety thousand dollars 90000 Wow. And then yeah. there are two people have their hands up. So Blake, do you still have a question? Uh, no, I'm, no, I'm good. And then Hussein, you had your hand up. I don't know if you still have a question. Um, yeah, I still have a question. First, thank you for this amazing um, event and uh, the presentation was really nice. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, actually, I'm currently working on, on similar projects, but uh -huh. I'm facing some difficulties, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask such thing here. Um, so just please stop me if, if, if it is not like uh, um, good enough time to, to ask well, something. I was saying, just hold on a second. I would say um, if you want to, uh, if everybody else wants to drop off, we can continue if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one session. And um, sure. just say, hey, thanks very much. 
Ronald, before we finish off, and Mike, if you want to stop recording, that's fine too. Um, I would just say that that's really cool. Yeah, we're uh, the timing for us is just really amazing. Um, I'm I, this is better than I know when you were at PX4, you couldn't really go into this detail, but um, right. so I, I really like this. This is really cool. Thanks again. Yeah, yeah, I know I, I, I kind of had to rush through it because of the amount of content. I'd be happy to do another one just on just the simulation piece. Um, yeah, I, I will probably hit you up in a few months for that. Okay, um, I guess we've given everybody due warning. So, Hussein, if you want to go ahead. <laughs>